I'm John Riley for Progressive Community Media with a special report on radio station WBAI New York, part of the Progressive Pacifica Network. Several WBAI local station board members and a large number of staff have explored the possibility of a partnership with Manhattan Neighborhood Network, or MNN for short, um, which is a local public access station with various partnerships with other media outlets and community groups. Among these partnerships are with Free Speech TV, a satellite public access station, and Next TV, which is a local consortium of nonprofit organizations, both of now which broadcast on two channels, one for each, provided by Manhattan Neighborhood Network. MNN's executive director, Dan Coughlin, has at various times offered partnership possibilities with WBAI New York. Dan Coughlin had a long history at Pacifica, working uh, initially at Democracy Now! in the early phases of the program, and then later as news director at Pacifica, then as day-to-day -day manager of the Pacifica campaign to end the corporatization of the network. Finally, as executive director of Pacifica from 2002 to 2005, Coughlin was able to eliminate more than $2 million in debt during that time and get the network solvent. The partnership most recently offered in late 2017 would have paid all of WBAI bills going forward, including an advance payment of $2 million to the Empire State Building, which was equal to the $1.8 million court judgment that Empire State Realty Trust had received in court because of WBAI and Pacifica's failure to pay the rent uh, in full for uh, many months. And that would have been a strong bargaining chip in negotiating with Empire State to forgive some or all of that debt. MNN was had also offered to pay all of the bills of, of the station going forward. They would have given WBAI its own cable TV channel, which they could simulcast on. They made clear they wanted to keep most of the programs that you love intact and dramatically shorten the fund drives, which uh, now stretch to be 135 or 40 days a year. One year it was 170 days. So this is about 38% to 44% of the entire year is used in fundraising. Um, then they would shorten it down to uh, about 30, 25, 30 days, um, whatever the current broadcast standard is for public radio. They also would have expanded the paid staff. This would have been a limited term partnership and would return to Pacifica management at the end of the contract period. Ownership would stay at Pacifica the entire time. In return, MNN would take over responsibility of, for management at the station. The reason that they would be doing this is to fulfill their mission of community partnerships and to strengthen their community profile. They too are facing challenges because of the expansion of the internet and the slow decline of cable TV, uh, because of the creation of uh, new internet TV networks such as Hulu, Netflix, Amazon Prime, and others. Unfortunately, the Pacifica National Board, or PNB for short, never responded to the offer, not even to explore it further. However, the idea gained popularity with dozens of WBAI programmers and many community members who held meetings to learn about the proposal at MNN's El Barrio studio. They created an online petition to pressure the PNB to begin discussions on this. And again, they did nothing. Formal discussions with MNN never took place, and Indy Caucus members, and Indy Caucus is a slate that controls the WBAI board and has controlled it for about 10 years, began ranting against the partnership and spreading rumors and inaccuracies uh, about what even MNN was and uh, for example, they refuse to acknowledge that both Time Warner and Verizon are required by law to provide channels and that 
the money that MNN gets from them and all the public access stations in New York City get from these big uh, cable providers is essentially a tax. But Indy Caucus wanted to portray it as that this would be the takeover of WBAI by Time Warner and Verizon. MNN is in no way controlled by Time Warner and Verizon. They have no say whatsoever over the editorial content. MNN has significant financial reserves, which would enable it to fulfill the generous offer that it made to Pacifica. One of the listener and staff groups supporting the partnership was the Save WBAI Coalition, which is now called WBAI Rising. What the Pacifica National Board did to pay what eventually became a $3 million debt to Empire State Realty Trust for WBAI's tower rental was to mortgage three of the network's buildings and to sell a fourth. And this mortgage was to the FJC Loan Agency Fund, which is a nonprofit. These buildings house the Los Angeles, Bay Area and Houston stations. And the loan, which must be repaid in three years in a $3 million lump sum, which is called a balloon payment, um, is something that WBAI cannot pay. A recent Pacifica Budget Committee determined that WBAI needed 174 days of fundraising at current levels just to break even without anything towards the loan repayment. And that's nearly half of all broadcast days. They later revised it downward to 134 days, which is still 37% of all broadcast days, uh, which is currently what is being planned. But that would leave WBAI hundreds of thousands of dollars short next year. WBAI's listenership has nosedived. In August, it was estimated to be about a third of what it was in 2005. Studies by Public Radio has shown listenership plummets when fund drives start and uh, drops to about 50% of normal levels. WBAI goes into fund drives so frequently that listenership never recovers by the time the next drive comes. So sometimes these drives are separated by only four or five weeks and the drives can go on for up to five weeks. WBAI desperately needs a cash infusion to modernize and to limit on-air fundraising. However, it can't get it from the other Pacifica stations, which have their own financial problems. Unfortunately, the Pacifico board is dominated by parochial views and ego issues. Regrettably, th three of the four Pacifica National Board members uh, that come from radio station WBAI are among those that rejected the MNN partnership out of hand. They've been on the local and national board for years and have play played an extremely negative role for much of the past decade. Pacifica's highest body uh, that makes decisions is the Pacifica National Board, and that's where all legal authority resides. If the board is bad, it's up to the listeners to change it. While there are elections, Coming to Pacifica, they are clearly sham elections. Graham Drew, the national election supervisor that was hired to run the election, canceled them. In his final report, he wrote, quote, One significant concern regarding the 2018 election process arose in September when at, after two concurrent board meetings on September 6th and September 20th, the customized timeline prepared to accommodate the late start failed to be approved in a board motion. Uh, I offered in both instances to attend and speak to this topic, and the offer was not accepted. Given the language of the bylaws requiring a board motion to approve an adjusted timeline, the lack of a board motion approving my timeline was and is in my view, an important oversight that could challenge the legitimacy of this election. Another significant concern arose earlier during my review of previous uh, Pacifica election reports provided to me, where it was clear that one of the major challenges would be the timely receipt of current elector lists, uh, i.e. members eligible to vote. 
which is required to administer a proper election. The National Election Supervisor for the 2015 election then described the lists as atrocious in her final report. The accuracy and integrity of these lists are vital to ensuring a fair and proper election. And in the event of having to defend against future appeals and legal actions by appellates, as can be the case with elections in general, and has been the case on numerous occasions in the past with Pacifica elections. He continued, quote, At present, I'm unable to reliably verify any of the applicants for candidacy due to the poor quality of the elector lists. A condition of eligibility is five um, to 15 signatures from members in good standing, and in numerous cases where the names were checked against the lists of members provided, there were errors, omissions, and discrepancies. In some cases, 30 to 40 percent of the signatures were from individuals not appearing on the member list, and in numerous cases at various stations, when the member or candidate challenged the absence of their name, um, including emailing photos of canceled donation checks, it was acknowledged by those preparing the list that the name did indeed belong on the list. In summary, despite best efforts on the part of all involved and the extension of the nomination period, the elector list required to complete with the election process remain incomplete and incorrect. Given this, I'm unable to verify candidates and proceed with the election. Close quote. He concluded, quote, I plan to announce the end of the 2018 election on Wednesday, October 31st, 2018. Time is of the essence to minimize the financial cost to Pacifica and to communicate an accurate message in a way that minimizes confusion among members and candidates. The decision is based on my constant monitoring of the overall election situation and the present lack of confidence that fair and proper elections can be administered. It is my hope that this decision will be followed up by actions to stop the cycle of flawed elections at Pacifica. It's important to note that maintaining an accurate membership registry is in fact a requirement of the Pacifica Foundation, not its local stations, as per Article 12, Section 1C of the Pacifica Bylaws. If this were being done, which it is not, then the responsibility to provide these would not need to be downloaded to the stations. In response, the cronyistic Pacifica National Board's main faction, con ruling faction, announced it had accepted uh, his resignation and hired a new election supervisor. There has been a tentative new timeline announced for the election, started with ballot mailing January 7th. 2019. Further, the new National Election Supervisor announced that in defiance of the bylaws of Pacifica and despite the laws which Pacifica must operate in, um, in California, mailings to members by members are no longer allowed. So who can vote in these elections? In order to vote in the uh, Pacifica elections, uh, those that have donated at least $25 to the station in the previous year are eligible or who have volunteered. Up next, we'll hear excerpts about the situation from Mimi Rosenberg that was held at the Left Forum. It is our station, and we are trying to enlist all of you to take it back because the media is critical. The media is critical to critique not so much the commercial media, we got that. The liberal media. You think Rachel Maddow's gonna talk about Palestine? How many times when Gil Noble tried to raise one word was he taken off the air where people had to fight like crazy to get him back on? Why do you think they have a Russia gate to completely distract? Who the hell lost the election? The damn Democrats lost it. It wasn't Russia who colluded and took it over. We lost it because we don't have a real movement 
to assume state power, and it was also lost because the Democrats on international issues and the like, who the hell got us welfare reform? Who the hell was that? The Democrats, Bill Clinton. Who the hell gave us the Crime Reform Act? Bill Clinton. So the fact of the matter is, and if you think one of these, whether Elizabeth Warren, you think Bernie Sanders is better on self-determination and the issue, okay, do you think, do you think that he's better on the issues of the, of the Congo, of Sudan, of the African continent, on Venezuela, on Cuba? The Democrats, so I'm more worried about the fact of the prominence of the, the racial mattos, the NPRs, and liberal media, which is why we need a WBAI, and this will conclude in two minutes. What we need, though, is a BAI rising, and we need, we need to work in tandem, in partnership with other progressive media entities for three reasons. One, because we need a different economic model, since this isn't working, and those debts are gonna be due in 18 months, right. less than that hence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the only, and BAI is the cash cow, right. we have a commercial license. Yes. The California stations could ditch us in two minutes, <laughs> use that money, because they're so narrow-minded too, and also they're in a triage system, and they're quite reactionary as to the collective. It's about them surviving. Right. They will absolutely sell us, use the money from our commercial license to shore up their own flagging and faltering resources. So we are in deep, deep trouble. And I give it like an 18-month turnaround time. So we're trying to look at another solution. And that is to think about partnering with other groups who have technology, resources to offer us, and to give us a broader voice within the community, meaning that collectively progressive media. We are going to uh, move to uh, Dan Coughlin, who is whom we want to partner with, not Dan Coughlin, but as executive director of Manhattan Neighborhood Network, because we think what we pick up from m and is we pick up youth, who is involved intimately in the training. We pick up financial resources, extra technology, and the concept politically of partnering with other media networks to become more holistic and better serve the movements and embed ourselves as we once were more in the community. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dan Coughlin. I am the president and CEO of Manhattan Neighborhood Network. It's great to be with you. Even if it is uh, through uh, virtual means, I really appreciate the event organizers and uh, my colleagues and comrades on the panel this afternoon. Um, thrilled to be here to talk about how we strengthen independent grassroots community media uh, in this very difficult moment in history, uh, and certainly a, a, a moment of change and transformation in media. Uh, Manhattan Neighborhood Network is a 28-year-old uh, community media institution. Uh, we have two facilities, one in East Harlem and one right here on uh, West 59th Street, right by uh, John Jay College. And just to give you a little introduction about what we do, let me roll this uh, one-minute little promo on what uh, is going on up at the East Harlem Firehouse. There's a place where the power of video takes on new meaning. A place where your voice matters and your ideas count. A place where you call the shots. And it's right here in vibrant East Harlem, Manhattan Neighborhood Network's Youth Media Center. A place where high school and college students can learn about media creation after school or on weekends in our free certificate program. Then put those video production and editing skills to use creating original content for our youth channel, social media platforms, and other internship opportunities. We're a full service studio right here in East Harlem with special programs and services that empower youth to use media and video production to raise awareness on important social issues. Here, we celebrate content created by youth for youth. Here, your opinions and creativity count and your voice will be heard. To learn more, go to www.mnn.org forward slash youth today. 
That's www.mnn.org forward slash youth. So Manhattan Neighborhood Network is in fact now the largest uh, media educator in the city of New York. We have about 1,200 students every year come and take our classes. We run community access channels. We have about 1,000 producers who contribute on our local community access channels. We also have uh, other channels in partnership with local groups, regional groups, and national groups. And really, as we move ahead as Manhattan Neighborhood Network, and I think a lot of other community media institutions around the country move forward in this digital age, so many of us are realizing that we can't be successful stuck in our silos. In Manhattan Neighborhood Network's case, it's the cable TV silo. For community radio stations, it might be the community radio silo. Uh, for newspapers, local independent nonprofit uh, grassroots newspapers, it might be just in the print uh, world. You can't succeed, you can't be engaged, you can't be sustainable unless we figure out a way to break out of these silos. The reasons are obvious for the last 20, 25 years. We've seen the digital you know, media counter-revolution really more than a, a revolution, uh, destroying old media models and obviously there's new forms of media uh, emerging. Obviously, the big monopolies, Facebook and Google, are crushing uh, so many other voices, but certainly it is really negatively impacting community media. Uh, hundreds of community radio stations, community media centers have been closing over the last 10 years. Very difficult environment to work with. Here at MNN, we're really uh, looking a lot at building partnerships with other community groups, other independent media organizations to try to break out of our cable TV silo and to become much more impactful in the way that people are using media and uh, living their lives. So for instance, one of our uh, more recent initiatives has been with our uh, colleagues at uh, Free Speech TV, a non-commercial independent Broad, direct broadcast satellite institution based out of Denver that's been around also about 25 years that has principally served for many years as a program distributor of community uh, grassroots uh, television programming to uh, hundreds and hundreds of community media centers around the country. But they too f understand that unless they can get out of the direct broadcast satellite world, the dishes and the directs, partner with local community cable uh, media, partner with uh, other organizations, journalistic organizations on the ground throughout the country, that they're not going to be successful. So we're really pleased to have uh, developed in recent years a partnership with Free Speech TV, where some of our locally produced programming goes up on the national direct broadcast satellite system, while then we also air those national and international voices on our local community cable channel right here in New York City. And you could see the MNN Free Speech TV partnership on 1301 on Spectrum right here in New York City, bringing independent grassroots voices to uh, New Yorkers. And in that way, that sustainability, that synergy, that synergistic relationship between Manhattan Neighborhood Network and Free Speech TV builds our ability to uh, continue to be impactful and viable in this digital media age. Similarly, we just uh, launched a new channel called Next.NYC, which is a partnership with 70 different community-based organizations here in the city, where we're taking their short-form video, putting up on our cable TV channel and a digital media platform so that their short form content, which is a new type of content, two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, seven minutes, gets up on cable TV and on a web and through other social media outlets. But it's again a new way of trying to respond to the new realities of uh, the media system while keeping independent, diverse, non-commercial voices alive. Another uh, proposal that we have uh, been working on for a number of years, going back four or five years, of seeking a different uh, partnership with WBAI Radio, where again, the idea with that was to 
uh, get cable community TV partnering with community radio in a way that could uh, enhance both institutions' ability to be successful in this digital media world. Uh, one of uh, one of the shows that we worked with, Rick Wolf's show, Rick came in, he needed a, a venue when there was a crisis for a studio at BAI. He just needed a studio to record his one hour day, a weekly radio show. And we said, sure, uh, but the deal is you can use an m and studio, but just like anybody else who uses m and it has to go up on our one of our video channels. So we uh, had Rick come in, came in, he sat behind this very camera, uh, did his one hour radio show. He took that radio show, put it up as a podcast, put it up on BAI, put it up on Audioport, the Pacifica radio distribution system. He uh, was on 30 or 50 now, maybe local community radio stations. He went on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Then we did a partnership with Free Speech TV. His local TV show then went right up onto uh, the Free Speech TV satellite, uh, reaching 30 million households in the United States. And lo and behold, you see a Marxist economist who's never had a platform in the last 40 or 50 years, all of a sudden has real impact and uh, real, uh, uh, his voice is being heard across multiple different platforms. And I think that is the example that we see where independent, non-commercial, non-state media can have uh, a real impact, but it, only, it has to change to survive in the years ahead. We have to build these kind of partnerships, whether it's on the local level, on the neighborhood level, uh, like a lot of work we do at Manhattan Neighbor Network with our firehouse, uh, whether it's on a regional level or national or global level, those kind of partnerships, uh, multi-platform, across multiple silos, are gonna be increasingly key to making sure that independent, nonprofit, non-commercial media stays alive in the years ahead. So uh, if there's one message that I have from Manhattan Neighborhood Network and based upon our real world experience is, let's look at building collaborations, partnerships, uh, other forms where we can come together to ensure that grassroots independent media has not only a chance to survive in this incredible period of uh, monopolization and concentration of power and wealth, not only that we can survive, but we can continue to be really impactful with the work that we do. On that note, thank you so much again for uh, inviting me to participate. That was MNN's Executive Director Dan Coughlin's uh, presentation at the WBAI Rising Workshop at the Left Forum.